You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR-FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. I am here with Tanith Frost, author of the Immortal Soulless series. The Immortal Soulless series is a vampire novel uh, set in St. John's, Newfoundland. The fifth book in the series, I believe, just came out today. How are you today, Tanith? I'm doing quite well today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So am I right in saying that the book that came out yesterday or today uh, is the newest book in this series? That is correct. Tell me about the series, if you could. Pretend that I know nothing about it. I actually do know a bit about it. I've read uh, the, some of the first book in this series, and it's very good. It's well worth checking out. But tell me a little bit about it, if you don't mind, and then maybe a little bit about the new book. Okay. I guess the easiest way to introduce the first book, although you did a good job introducing the series, the way I usually present it is that... No one asked Aviva whether she wanted to become a monster. Um, She's now soulless, predatory, feeding on the blood of the living for survival, which has been a rough transition. Uh, She was a former church kid when she was alive. But uh, when rogue vampires begin a gory murder spree in her clan's territory, Aviva kind of has to embrace her inner darkness if she wants to save the light and the world she left behind. Isn't Aviva a kind of moisturizer? Isn't that something that you you put on for wrinkles? I don't think so, but I would definitely buy it if that were a product that I could buy for that. No, it makes sense. Aviva, look like you're immortal and soulless. Actually, I think it is an insurance company, though. Interesting. Okay, so tell me about this newest chapter. So there's four books out so far, and this is the fifth. Uh, What's the name of it, and what's what's it about? Book five in the series is called Temptation, and I'm trying to think how much I can say without giving away too much about the previous books. Uh, Throughout the series, as Aviva is unraveling mysteries relating to her clan and power struggles within it and within the larger world of vampires, she encounters a lot of different creatures. Uh, There are a lot of mysteries along the way, and in this book, dealing with some vampires who exist on the outer fringes of what's already a very secretive society. And she also meets a creature who claims to be either an angel or a demon. He doesn't really care which one anyone calls him. And together they have to get to the bottom of a threat to the safety of all of the vampires in Newfoundland. Oh, wow. And possibly the world. Oh, wow. That sounds really cool. All right. Uh, So is this the end of this series, or will it continue on, do you think, after this? I think my readers would be pretty upset if it didn't continue after the way that I ended this one. Uh, I actually have seven books planned for the series. Seven's a really popular number. I kind of lament that I never went with a smaller number for my series. Like, the, the first one of mine was... 10. The second one's going to be 10. I think I'm going to pare it back after that and start doing 5s or 7s or what have you. Is there a reason that you picked 7? Is it just the amount of story you had? What's what's going on there? Honestly, I think it's because 7 or 8 books is about my limit for reading a series. I mean, if I love a series and it continues on past 7 or 8 books, I'll stick with it obviously. But if I am looking to start a series and I see that it has 10 or 12 books in it, I'm probably not going to start because it seems like a huge investment. Uh, So that was part of it. And I needed to know that it could sustain my interest as an author. Uh, I had an idea when I started out of how big I wanted the story to be. When I started out, I had the idea for book one and didn't really know where it was going after that. But within a few books, I had an idea of where things were going to end up. And it looked like it was going to take seven or eight books. So seven books it is. Yeah, no, that's a good answer. And I, I find that's correct, actually. I, I find that when I'm trying to push the now complete ten book series, it's hard. There are, there are some times when people will say, I would love to start this, but that's a bit daunting or something to that effect. Uh, to the point where I've started to try and group them into smaller arcs, like the first three books form a little story arc. The second four books start form a little story arc. 
So I'll, I'll start to do uh, a little bit of marketing misdirection like that. Uh, tell me more about your your writing process. How does how do you come up with these stories? How do you write them? Um, what what's your process like? Uh, because I know you're a very busy person. I guess busy it's a relative term. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that I do this full time, but I do have a lot of distractions and other commitments during my days. Uh, so fitting writing in can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, but as far as the ideas and getting started on the stories, I get ideas in a lot of different ways. I find it's usually just things that are happening in my own life and things that are important to me. Uh, you know, two or three ideas will come together to form something that's new, that's not like anything that I've ever seen for personally, but it turns into a story that I really want to tell. In the case of Resurrection, which is uh, Immortal Soulless Book One, that happened because I was out walking my dog on Easter Sunday, and we were walking past a church, and there were church bells going, and that will be very familiar to anyone who's read the book, because that turned into the first scene of the book, because we were walking along, and all of a sudden I had this character in my ear, and she's started telling me her story and I I never wanted to write vampires I had no intention of doing something that so many people had already done and had done so well but as it turned out I actually had something new to bring to the table and it turned out to be something that I was really interested in doing so here we are nice yeah no I think that uh, that you do do a new spin on the vampire lore and I think actually as much as it never really went away it's coming back around again, and I think your books are kind of positioned well for when it comes back around again. So I think it should be a lot of fun. I think we'll see it gain in popularity in the next year or so, especially as the series starts to wrap up and people can maybe get it all at once and stuff like that. That's definitely what I'm hoping for. I'm certainly more of a writer than I am a marketer, but ideally that's what I would like. Uh, if I can finish up the story at seven books and people can go into it knowing that they have this huge, wonderful adventure with excellent reviews from beginning to end, and they can really look forward to getting into it and finishing it whenever they want to, that would be absolutely perfect. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so spoil the last book in the series for me. Absolutely not. Yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't think that that was going to happen. Uh, so what's next for you? <laughs> this book looks great, uh, and, and I'm hoping it's going to do well. You don't spend a lot of time doing shows or signings or anything like that. So where could we get this book from you if we wanted to? Well, you can get it in ebook format on Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Nook. Uh, paperbacks are currently available through Amazon. And if someone were desperate to get their hands on a signed copy, uh, you can always email me and you can find that information on my website. And I'm happy to set something up as long as people are prepared to pay for shipping. So this book is published through Sparrow Cat Press. Can you tell me a bit about Sparrow Cat? Sparrow Cat Press is an extremely private publisher that I share with one other person who I also share brain space and office space with. Uh, would that be Kate Sparks over? That would be Kate Sparks. So tell me about the name Sparrow Cat. How did, how did that come about? That's an interesting one. As much as Engine Books is a weird name that I always have to explain to people... <laughs> Sparrow Cat seems tons of fun. What's the epitus behind that? I know that it came after I had to reject several other names because they were taken, but I think that one came from the fact that the last name Sparks apparently traces back to the word Sparrowhawk, which is where the sparrow portion of that comes from, and then the cat is from Kate. So it's sort of Kate Sparks reversed and changed around a little bit and then it sort of turned into this adorable tiny griffin like creature in my head and that was that that sounds great actually that seems i love those kind of names that come out of mistranslations that was uh that was that was a great moment in doctor who for me when you realized that melody pond was river song uh and fun stuff like that i'm gonna pretend that i know what you're talking about so i sound cool you you know Doctor Who, don't you? You've got to know Doctor Who. Uh, I live with someone 
who knows Doctor Who, which means that I have sort of absorbed a lot of Doctor Who by osmosis. So I kind of know who like, who River Song is, and I will get a lot of references, but I have not actually sat down and watched Doctor Who. I'm ashamed to say. All right. Well, you do this full time, which means you make your own hours, which means you can take 40 minutes out of every week and watch an episode. You know, just saying. You're owed that break time, and you might as well use it for something wonderful and whimsical and magical. Okay, but then when would I play Assassin's Creed? Preferably never, because you're an intelligent person, and that game's that game. (laughs) That game's... You're clearly an intelligent person yourself. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Okay. What... If any, literary pilgrimages have you gone on? In other words, have you ever traveled to write or traveled to research for writing? Honestly, the farthest I've actually gone for writing research is the St. John's area. I live in central Newfoundland, so that's about a four-hour drive for me, which is not long, but it has been very necessary for the Immortal Solace series because uh, some of the stories are set in St. John's, some are in the surrounding area, uh, some of it's set closer to the West Coast. In the future, I'm really hoping to get in a major epic supernatural battle in Twillingate, if only because then I'll have to actually spend more time in Twillingate to research it. Uh, So that's it for those literary pilgrimages. On the other hand, there are a lot that I would love to make, not just for my own research, but just for the sake of going. I would love to go to Maine and maybe bump into Stephen King, maybe just see places that have inspired him. Uh, But that would be probably at the top of my list for reading-related pilgrimages that I would like to make, which are also, of course, writing-related. Excellent. Yeah, Maine would be up on my top ten list, too, actually, for sure. Tanith, what is the first book that made you cry? Or the book that you remember, because some people can't remember back that far. First one that I can remember making me cry, like sobbing, ugly cry, snot running down my face, was Where the Red Fern Grows. Because, spoiler alert, dogs die, and I've never handled that well, but I think I was in seventh grade when I read it, and uh, that was just an especially bad time for those kind of things hitting hard and a lot of things making me cry so yeah that's the first one i remember that book has been the answer three times now so you are definitely definitely not alone there (laughs) i'm not surprised no definitely not Tanith, does writing energize you or exhaust you i wish i could say it energized me uh it does feel like a necessary thing for me because i tend to get depressed and anxious if i'm not writing but on a day-to-day basis it definitely exhausts me Uh, If I get a solid day of writing in, if I get 4,000 words, or I mean, on a really good day, 5,000, but sometimes just 3,000 words, I will be mentally exhausted and my brain will be complete mush by five or six o'clock in the evening. That's that's actually a huge amount. Uh, When I, before I started going full time, I was getting 2,000 a day in. And then I went full time, and so the administrative arm of Engine started to need more of my attention. But I thought, okay, I'm going full time now. I'll be able to do four thousand or five thousand. No, I'm lucky if I can get a thousand with all the other stuff I'm doing, which it feels horrible. It feels depressing. But there's there's so much else going on. Yeah, I have trouble even getting started if I feel like I'm going to get interrupted before I get a full scene or a full chapter done. And sometimes that'll be two thousand words. But for one of my larger chapters, that will be three or even closer to 4,000. And depending on how my focus and concentration are on any given day, I might try to squeeze two chapters in or two scenes in. So it can add up, but that depends a lot on how my mental energy is doing. What are, in your mind, are common traps or pitfalls for aspiring writers? Uh, I think the biggest one for me back when I wanted to be an author but it wasn't happening was perfectionism and expecting everything to just magically flow from my pen or through my keyboard and be polished and perfect on the first try and I was getting bogged down with writing and rewriting the same first chapters over and over and never actually finishing a story so I guess that was the biggest trap for me was just not pushing on and not seeing the value in finishing something that's absolutely horrible but that can be 
revised. Yeah, no, for sure. That's that's an important one, definitely. Tenneth, does having a big ego help or hurt writers? I honestly wouldn't know because I don't have one. I have a horrible case of imposter syndrome. I'm really proud of the books that I write, but I, as an author, do not have a big ego. It's not even big enough that I'm comfortable promoting my own work. Honestly, I would say that it probably helps because... Uh, at least on the on the promotion side of things, I have no idea whether it helps or hurts on the writing side. I can see it being detrimental on that side, but I'm guessing that authors with big egos probably make more money. So long answer short, I guess it depends on how you define success. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, perfect. Tenneth, what is your writing kryptonite? What can just stop a writing session cold dead? Interruptions. Or just knowing that I could be interrupted. Uh, I have a lot of trouble sitting down and writing, you know, say I have 30 minutes and then I know that somebody's going to be knocking on my door or I have an hour, but then I know that I have to get ready to go to an appointment. Uh, it's very hard for me to shift gears into or out of writing mode. So I guess that's probably my kryptonite is uh, just not being able to get into the writing mindset for short periods of time. I would probably get a lot more writing done if I could do that. Tanith, did you have you ever considered writing under a pseudonym? <laughs> I am a pseudonym. Do you try to be more original when you're writing, or are you trying to deliver on genre needs when, uh, and delivering the reader what they expect when they pick up a certain type of book? That's a hard question. Uh, I think when I'm doing my brainstorming, when I'm doing my outlining, and even through writing the first draft and first revisions, I'm writing for myself, uh, which means that I'm just telling the story that has captured my interest. As far as trying to conform to genre expectations, I am aware that that's important later for marketing purposes, but that's something that I still struggle to put into play earlier on in the writing process. Yeah, I really struggle with it too, actually, a lot. Tana, do you think someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotions strongly, if they don't have high emotional intelligence, or do you think that's not necessary for being a writer? Wow, these are good questions. I think, see, okay, as far as feeling emotions strongly, I don't think that's strictly necessary. I have depression, and that means that I often don't feel very much. I don't feel joy. I don't necessarily feel a lot of sadness. I don't feel a lot of anything. I think the important thing for authors is to have an understanding of the emotions. Uh, even having past experience with the emotions, having empathy, understanding what their characters are going through, and being able to use that not only to show what's happening inside of the characters, but also to be able to evoke those emotions in the readers. Uh, so a certain level of emotional intelligence is important, but I wouldn't say you necessarily have to be an overly emotional person. Okay, that's actually a really good answer. That's great. By the way, if there's any of these you don't want to answer at all, like you're like, nope, that's off-brand for me, or nope, I don't want to answer that question, you can just say skip or whatever. I, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. The reason I keep saying your name before each one is so that when I'm going through and cutting these together, I'll, I'll know who I'm talking to so that I can credit each answer correctly. Sorry if that's weird. That's fair. Oh, and I don't think it's weird that you keep saying Tanith. It's actually good for me because I'm not used to being called Tanith. So that's good for both of us. Cool. Your husband never calls you Tanith? Skip. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, he, did. <laughs> no, he, he never, never once. Never has. <laughs> I feel like we were both on the same wavelength with that question. That is definitely not going in. That could have been a really awkward question, Matthew. Yeah, that's definitely not on the list of questions. Although I should put it there. That would be fun if I just ask every author that comes on if their significant other ever called them Tanith. <laughs> Please do. Um... What other authors are you friends with or associated with, and how do they help you become a better writer? Tanith? Uh, my best author friend is an author named Krista Walsh, who lives in Ottawa. She's a fellow Canadian author, and she's also a fellow urban fantasy author. Uh, we met uh, long before my alter ego ever published her first book, and 
she has become so important to me in so many ways, not just because she reads my books, not at the first draft stage, but after some revisions, she's one of the first people who gets their hands on it. And she helps me make my books better. And I do the same for her. And I learn a lot through having the opportunity to do that for such a good author. And uh, also, I think it's important to have author friends just for moral support. And she has been absolutely amazing for that through the years. But I'm also fortunate to have met quite a few excellent authors here in Newfoundland. Uh, Candace Osmond and J.J. King have been wonderfully supportive for me. Um, they sort of dragged me out of my shell and uh, have made me go to a few actual live events with real people, which is hard for me. So that's been wonderful. And uh, actually, I've got a whole shelf of books in my office by authors who have done similar things for me. So that's fantastic. Tenneth, do you <clears throat> want each book to stand on its own, or are you trying to build a body of work with connections between each one and that kind of thing? At the moment, I'm writing a series. Uh, so each book does stand on its own as a story, but they should be read in sequence. So in that way, the series will form its own body of work. I hope that as I do other projects in the future, they will either fit into the same universe or at least have something that carries over in terms of the mood of the books or the themes or the genre so that people will be comfortable jumping from one to the next. Tenneth, if you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would it be? What kind of language am I allowed to use on this radio show? We we don't curse a lot, but you could say something <laughs> along the lines of it. <laughs> I would tell my younger writing self to get her head out of her ass and sit herself down in a chair and start writing something even if it's going to be crap at the end. Because even if it's horrible, she's going to be way ahead of where she would be otherwise. Yeah, that, that's fair. I tell that to people all the time. Actually, I, I find there's this odd defeatist attitude, even if, with people writing essays. Like, they won't hand in an essay unless it's perfect. And I'm like, if you don't hand it in, you'll get a zero. Literally any mark is better than a zero. But they, they won't finish sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I make sure that my books are as close to perfect as they can possibly be before publication. But my problem that my younger writing self had was that she wasn't willing to even write a horrible first draft. I would never encourage her to actually publish something that was horrible, but she didn't understand that the horrible draft was the first step to moving toward that imperfect but far, far better finished draft. Yeah, I wonder if it would help if it was possible if uh, if you could get a collection of authors, like good authors like King or George R. R. Martin to actually publish their first drafts, like as a special edition, like the first draft edition, so we can see just how bad it is. Because I feel like that would actually be helpful for young authors, like when you were younger, to actually see a very bad first draft from an established author. And then you could see how the process works and how far it comes. I think it would be helpful. I think it would be a huge <laughs> I think it would be a huge challenge to get any of them to actually do that because I think there is a lot of ego involved and a lot of authors do want readers to just think that there's some kind of magic happening and they sprinkle fairy dust over their keyboard and this perfect story comes out of them. And I think even the ones who admit that their first drafts suck would be reluctant to actually let anybody see how badly they suck or in what ways they suck. But if someone could actually make that happen, I think it really would be good for younger authors. Yeah, I agree. I really agree, actually. I'm going to call Stephen King and get him on that now. <laughs> how did publishing your first book change your process of writing, <laughs> Tana? The first book that I published wasn't my first book book that I published. How did the act of publishing your first book, regardless of which of you published it, change? how did it change <laughs> your process of writing, Tanith? Ah, uh, the act of publishing. Okay, actually, I can answer that because the act of publishing my first book miraculously meant that I had suddenly a lot of readers waiting for the next part of the story. And if I hadn't had those people waiting for it, I probably never would have finished the first series that I ever wrote. Tanith, what is the best money you ever spent as a writer? 
definitely hiring a really, really, really good editor for my first book. Uh, someone who would not only fix my grammar and punctuation and errors like that, but who would really dig deep into the story, tell me exactly what was wrong with it, no matter how badly it hurt. Uh, I think I learned more from him than I would have if I had spent the same amount of money on college courses or anything equivalent. Yeah, I, I learned a lot the first time a really good editor got a hold of mine, too. Are there any authors that you like that you disliked at first but later grew into? Their writing, I mean, not them personally. You know, I can't think of any. Okay, that's fine. I think I could probably think of... No, I could probably think of authors who I was really excited to read and ended up disappointed with, but I don't want to talk about that. So. Yeah, no, that's a later question. <laughs> that would be a bad question. That, that's a later question. Oh, no. Tanith, as a writer, what would you choose as your mascot or avatar or spirit animal? I'm going to go with a sparrow cat because that's the name of my publishing company. And it's a feisty little creature. And if that's not what I am, then what? it's what I aspire to be. Would a sparrow cat self-cannibalize? It might chew on its own feathers. Are you asking if it would actually consume its own flesh? Kind of like the snake consuming itself, you know? Like that, that thing. I picture like this, like it's just constantly at turmoil with itself. Always hunting itself and being preyed upon by itself. That would probably be more appropriate for me, but I don't think the sparrow cat would actually do that. Okay, acknowledged then. Um, Tenneth, uh, what do you owe the real people upon whom you base your characters? Well, obviously, this question is only for if you do base your characters on real people. I don't base most of my characters on real people. Uh, sometimes they will pick something up from me, something from my life experiences, but I tend to make my characters up rather than basing them on real people. That said, there may have been one occasion when somebody me off and I sort of kind of based a character on him and had him eaten by werewolves, possibly. I have possibly done that exact same thing, except not with a werewolf. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's not uncommon. Yeah. Yeah, we're horror writers. We're going to do that. If we need a cannon fodder person, we're going to pick someone we hate. How many unpublished or so half-finished books do you have in your <laughs> private library, Tana? I have one book in my private library that would be eventually, I hope, published under another name that has been to the editor and has been ripped apart. And I have not yet been brave enough to take time to put it back together. Mostly because I'm currently working on finishing a series, but I will be getting back to it. So I guess the total is one. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I've, I've got a few like that that are in various stages. What does literary success look like to you? Literary success is an idea that is currently evolving for me. Because there's a lot of pressure to define literary success as having tons of readers and especially making tons of money from book sales and making lists with bestsellers. And that is certainly one kind of literary success. But I'm starting to realize that literary successes for me might be more about writing the books that I want to write and making them as good as I can possibly make them and leaving behind that kind of a legacy. Wonderful. What kind of research do you do, and how long do you spend researching before the beginning of a book, Tana? I do geographical research for my settings for my books. I do a lot of research on how long it would take for different kinds of wounds to kill people. Uh, I do research on... Actually, I would say that those are the two primary kinds of research that I do. And most of my research, uh, the location stuff I like to have in place before I start the first draft. I at least like to have an idea of where things are happening. And then maybe I'll visit the place again and polish it up later. The other stuff I will sort of research as I go along. Or if I come up against something that I don't know while I'm writing the first draft, I'll stick a pin in it. And then I will do the research before I revise. Well, thanks, Tanith, for coming on. Uh, everyone should check out Resurrection, the first book in the Immortal Soulless series, or if you've already got the first four, definitely check out Temptation. It is on sale now in all major platforms. Thank you for coming on, Tanith. 
Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.